2002, and then in 2005 we moved to Berkeley, and, um, so I'm directing this, this center there. And so basically I'm a neuroscientist, a computational neuroscientist, and uh, so the group I work with is basically a group of uh, PIs, professors, uh, postdocs, and students uh, who have backgrounds in very diverse fields ranging from uh, psychology and engineering and physics to, and math um, and also neuroscience. And we're basically trying to bring these ideas from, from different fields together um, to understand the information processing that's going on in the brain, how neural circuits, how, how neural circuits work. So a lot of what we're doing is constructing computational and mathematical models of what we think is going on. And then as we construct these models, we can then design experiments together with experimental neuroscientists to try to, uh, to, test, the, to test these theories. Uh, so what I want to tell you about today is, um, so I guess two, um, two, two threads here. One is how findings from neuroscience, so ideas that are, have been developed through computational neuroscience are making their way into technology. And, uh, and in turn, how this, this development in technology, I think, could end up feeding back onto, onto neuroscience and giving us new insights about what might be going on in the brain. And uh, another is, I think, the potential, uh, potential to tell us about aesthetics and art and the visual arts. Uh, as we learn more about the visual system, I think we learn more about perception and, and the underlying sort of mechanisms by how we see it. It helps us understand why, why do certain things look interesting or strange to us. Uh, and uh, so I think that's uh, sort of um, something I hope to give you a, a, a feeling, a flavor of here. So, uh, so first of all, first of all, this, this problem of, um, of of technology. So, so one of the one of the really difficult problems in technology now uh, in, 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 uh, is uh, how how to recognize how to tell computers to recognize what's in an image, right? So places like Google and Facebook, uh, they have tons of images on their hard drives. Uh, so, for example, at Facebook, uh, they get, I think, of 500 million images uploaded uh, every single day. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a huge amount of, a huge amount of data that's, that's just coming in all the time. And, of course, they want to know what's in these images. Uh, maybe for reasons that <laughs> we may not want them to, but, you know, this is a sort of interesting problem in general. It would be very helpful if we could get computers to sort of understand what's in an image and, and sort of they could sort of figure out what to do with it. Okay. And this is a this is a problem that's been uh, a very sort of age-old problem that's been very difficult to tell computers how how to do this. And this is sort of a, one way to understand why, because this is something that's hard to sort of appreciate sometimes. Because you know we just open our eyes and it just seems effortless. Like there's this image and yeah, yeah, there it is. I can see everything that's going on in the room. What's the what's the problem? Why can't I just computer pro uh, program a computer to do that? Uh, so this is the problem. So what we're showing you here are two images of the exact same scene from slightly different angles. Uh, and we're showing you the data in these images in a way that you're not used to seeing. So what an image is, is basically a two-dimensional array of, of intensity values. is how much light is in each falling on each location in the image. So it's a two-dimensional array of intensity values. And usually we just plot that out. We just you know, shade each pixel according to its intensity. And you can look at that and you can say, ah, that's what that scene is. Here what we're showing you is that same data, but it's an elevation plot. So at each location in that 2D array, we're just making the height of the surface proportional to the intensity value. Okay? So this is an image, and that's an image. And each, 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 each height there is, is um, corresponding to the value of some pixel in the image. Anybody want to guess what these are images of? What is this a scene of? Cats. Cats. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good guess. So close. So it's, uh, this, is what, this is what you're looking at here. And uh, so now, once you, once you see it, I don't know if there's a, oh yeah, there's one here, okay. Okay, go ahead. So, so anyways, uh, so you can kind of see what's going on here. Now, you know, with, uh, after, you know, after the fact, you know, with this wheel of bicycles, you can sort of see this ridge of intensities in the image, right, uh, going on and so forth. And also you can sort of get appreciation for why maybe it's so difficult uh, to, to sort of you know see this is this is the problem the computer faces right this is the problem also your brain faces right of trying to make sense of it ah, okay great thanks this button right here okay. so this is the problem that your brain faces right so you see all these large fluctuations in the signal here right and so a computer could get easily distracted by that and so oh that must be something very important going on here but we see in the image that's just lights flashing through the trees and shadows in the background. Right? When you look at the scene, you can effortlessly discount that and sort of focus on the objects of interest. And you can immediately understand any you know, two-year-old or three-year-old, or probably even infant, can look at the scene and appreciate that these are basically the same thing. 
Okay, so this is the magnificent power going on in the brain, something we have really no, uh, almost a very, very little understanding of how this actually happens. Okay, the computational basis. So there's a lot we've learned from neuroscience, but we're still missing kind of a picture of the computational basis of how this happens. Okay, so computers are nowhere close to being able to do anything like this. So there's been a lot of success, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. Um, and, 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 but you know, so it's kind of starts starting to happen now. Okay. So, so, so one thing we know about this process is that you don't solve this problem in one, in one step. The visual system is kind of broken into a bunch of different modules that sort of, te uh, that sort of peel apart different parts of the problem. A lot of what we know about the vision, the visual cortex, comes from studies of animals. This is just showing you the, the, the cerebral cortex of the macaque monkey. Uh, it's sort of inflated so you can see all the areas in the folds of the cerebral cortex. And this is the back of the brain, this is the front of the brain. And uh, so all these colored regions are, air, are regions of the cortex that have to do with vision. And the cat monkey, about half the cerebral cortex is devoted to vision. Okay, so all these areas are involved with vision. And in humans, it's maybe about 20 to 25% or so of the, of the area of the cortex. And so each one of these uh, colored <coughs> regions here is a different visual area that's sort of <coughs> doing some chunk of the problem here. Okay, and this is illustrated below here. So it's sort of a wired, wiring diagram that's been worked out over decades of research. Of, you know, putting anatomical tracers in one area and looking at sort of where the wires come into that area, where the wires go to from a certain area. So you can take all these colored regions and kind of make a box diagram, a flow chart of how the information flows from one region to the next. So this is the first visual area where ventral information comes into. It goes to the splitting of these two uh, streams, the so-called dorsal stream and the ventral stream here. These regions down here have to do more with object recognition. If you suffer lesions to these areas, then you're not very good at recognizing objects, but you might be able to still navigate the scene. And if you suffer damage to these areas here, uh, you, you, you're very poor at kind of uh, guiding arm movements or reaching or navigating around a scene, but you can recognize people with other objects just fine. Okay, there's sort of complementary aspects of scene analysis going on in the different visual areas. So, uh, so at this basic architecture, so you know, people have looked at this you know, wiring diagram for a long time and kind of pondered, computer scientists look, like, look at this kind of wiring diagram and kind of ponder, gosh, what's that doing? Maybe I should build my computer this way. And uh, you know, this might be sort of maybe some insight of how to, how to sort of tease apart this problem of vision. And indeed, that's exactly what's been happening um, now in the field of computer vision. So some of the early studies, what well, people are looking at this, this first visual area, V1, which gets this information from the retina, uh, through the LGM through the thalamus. Okay, so when, this was done um, in the early, early 1960s by Hugo and Weasel. And what they found is that there's neurons in this area of V1 that are, um, that are basically coding features in, in, in different parts of the image. So they found this sort of hierarchy of neurons, so-called simple cells, that are orientation selective. So a simple cell, when you record from this neuron, it fires whenever it finds an edge, whenever, whenever, whenever an edge in the, in the scene falls within its receptive field. And it's selective also to the orientation of that edge within the scene. And different neurons are sensitive to different orientations and different positions within the scene. And the population of all these neurons together sort of tiles the whole visual scene and builds a kind of feat uh, featural representation um, of the image. And then what they found is another class of these cells, so-called complex cells, which are also orientation selective but more invariant to the position of the feature, meaning that they don't, they're not so fussy about the exact position. Okay, they're sort of forming an abstraction about a certain shape independent of the details. Uh, and, then, and, then, uh, and then another level of cells, which looks like it's sort of summing these inputs from complex cells, they turn to hyper-complex cells. Okay? So they sort of came up with this terminology. And uh, so this was all sort of based on physiology. This is just from biologists poking electrons in the, poking electrons in the brain and sort of looking what they want to see. And uh, so this, was, this turns out was very inspirational to engineers and computer scientists in trying to design vision algorithms. And the first person who did that was a guy named Fukushima in Japan. This is not the nuclear power plant. This is one of the first papers I read, actually, in computational neuroscience. So whenever people talked about this nuclear power plant disaster, I kept on thinking, you know, what books that give me this paper, actually. Uh, so, uh, so Fukushima uh, was very much inspired by, by Hugo and Weasel's models. And so he built this model of, you know, how maybe a, an artificial neural network might be able to recognize um, objects in the scene. So it basically starts here with the image. The image, an input image, is, is, is presented here with some shape on it. He, he just had sort of handwritten digits presented, and, and basically a layer of feature analysis, uh, a layer of feature analysis uh, followed by, so the image input image here, a uh, feature analysis followed by pooling. So basically where these neurons here sum over some local region of a feature map, this, let's say it's selected to one orientation in the scene. These neurons sum over some region to, to, to do something like complex cells, okay, be more invariant. 
And then you do another layer of feature extraction, and then pooling and feature extraction and pooling, until finally you find in the last layer you can get uh, neurons that are selected to uh, different objects within the state. So one neuron might um, fire response to digits, uh, the digit four, and another neuron might fire in response to the digit three. Okay? And what he showed is you basically tune, you can tune all the weights in the system, the connections from one state to the next. You can tune these weights in an automatic, unsupervised way. It basically self-organizes from experience. This is by showing you these patterns. You can learn to self-organize this representation so you can basically recognize objects in the output layer here. Okay, so this was, I think, one of the first big successes, and then that was followed by a guy at um, AT&T Bell Labs named Yon Lacoon, who's now, he's now the director of research at um, Facebook, the Facebook AI lab, uh, a professor at NYU. And so what he did is he was, you know, basically he got a contract from the post office at the time to recognize handwritten, handwritten digits that the people writing on envelopes, right, so they could have a computer automatically recognize the zip code. And so he basically modeled this very much off of Fukushima's new Kakutron model, which is in turn based on people and Weasel's model. So the idea here is you have the input image, you do some feature extraction and pooling, feature extraction and pooling, and find a classification layer up here. And uh, he traced, tried this in a purely supervised fashion, meaning that you put, a, put the digit five in, and you have a teacher that tells the system, well, that's a five, you should turn on this node here. And if it doesn't turn on that node, you punish it, and you tell it you give it an error signal and then it learns from that error signal how to adjust all these weights in the system to do a better job. And you do that over and over again for many different digits, and basically you can learn to recognize um, individual digits, digits quite accurately. Um, many years later, so, so what's sort of happened in between, notice this was 1989. Um, so all throughout the 90s and, uh, and a lot of the early 2000s, uh, this approach of you know, constructing neural networks is, was largely kind of frowned upon by people in computer sciences, was superseded by approaches of machine learning and statistics. And uh, people like Yellen Lacoon kind of persevered and said, no, no, this really can work. This is the right way to go. Uh, and, and sort of neural networks fell to a period of disfavor for, for a long period. Uh, but we're, we're, we're re recently experiencing this revival and uh, through a lot of different labs in, in the university system, but also um, this is work done by Kwok Lee at, at, at the, Google, the Google Brain Project. So this is basically the result of uh, Andrew Ng I believe, uh, talking to Sergey Brin, uh, and their page and convincing them that they should form a research group dedicated to these, uh, basically scaling up these neural network models. And uh, so Kwok Lee basically constructed this model where he, uh, he does this, this thing called sparse coding, where you have neurons that are extracting features in the image. These neurons are just looking at one little local region of the image here and learning, learning features, learning to form a feature representation in an unsupervised way. Uh, and then a stage of pooling again, just like in, in the New York Tron model, and then a stage of normalization where basically these neurons are kind of dividing the response by the overall activity in the population. So you're sort of coding a relative value relative to other neurons. And you basically take this stage, and you just do that over and over again. So you repeat that basic computation all across the image and at one layer, and then you, know, you do it again. Right? So you do this sort of form one representation of the image here. And then you just take the output of this layer, feed it to another layer, which is doing the exact same thing computationally as this, this layer down here. And you just repeat that over and over again. And again, this is kind of inspired on this idea of looking at the visual cortex and saying, well, gosh, you know, the architecture of V1 kind of looks like the architecture of V2, which kind of looks like the architecture of V3 and V4 and so forth. It looks like something, is, some design which nature came up with, it, which just got recapitulated um, uh, in, in over and over again. And so when they train this network, uh, so if you're going to get this, guess the right answer here. When they train this network on millions of images, then you find, so when uh, Fukushima did this on uh, digits, basically he found uh, neurons at the top here respond, that respond to individual digits. Uh, and now it, what, what, uh, what Kwok Lee did is train this network on images from YouTube. So he just took millions of images coming from YouTube and trained it in a self-organized, unsupervised way to, to discover sort of interesting representations. And guess what he found at the top here? Uh, if, what the neurons are selected to. <laughs> yes. So he found, so, so basically in a completely self-organized manner, what this neuron, what this network sort of learned from the data, with no teacher sort of telling it what it's supposed to do, it learned basically there's certain categories of objects occurring in these movies, right, that sort of ways to organize things. So, one, so if you look in one of, you know, one of these units at the top of the network, one of those units happened to be selected to cats. So this is, this is a, basically a synthesis of uh, showing basically the optimal, the image that optimizes the response of that neuron, <laughs> maximizes the response of that neuron. And you found other nodes that are selected to faces, and other nodes that are selected to other, other objects. So basically all this, 
all this structure kind of emerged from the network self in a self-organizing way. So this really got, got started to turn a lot of heads in the field. But I think the real sort of you know pinnacle moment occurred with this work of Alice Kojewski, um, Billy Suska, and Jeff Hinton, where they turned this down in a supervised way. But basically, the exact same architecture. You start with the image here. You have a layer of feature extraction and pooling, feature extraction and pooling, and so forth. And they stack this up into an ungodly number of layers. And this is something you know, ten, even ten years ago, you would have never thought of doing because this, we didn't have the computational resources to do it. And everybody also thought that it would be impossible to train in a, in a purely um, supervised, I mean, um, in a supervised fashion. So again, the way they train this, is they show it here, an image of a cup, let's say, and then they tell the uh, they tell the network, okay, this is a cup. You should turn on, you should turn on, you know, one particular node up here. There's a thousand different categories, a thousand different objects you could, you want it to recognize. You put an image of a cup in, and you say, well, you should turn on that node. And if it doesn't do that correctly, then you give it an error signal, and that tells you how to adjust all these weights in the system. Okay, and this is amazing because this, this system has 60 million weights, 60 million parameters that has to be tuned. Okay, so it's just a behemoth. Uh, and so you do that you know, for cups and pictures of cats and animals and you know, school buses and you know, a thousand categories, a lot of stuff, right, you can recognize. And, uh, and it works. I mean, they got this amazing, you know, this amazing recognition rate. Uh, something that the first try is something like 60% uh, recognition rate. And now it's been it's, it's steadily climbing up to like 70, 80, it's now well in the 90s. And so this is just sort of showing you kind of what's, to put that in perspective, um, this is kind of a chart of the, the, the state-of-the-art performance that people were getting in computer vision using non-neural network techniques. They were just sort of coming along with their algorithms. They said, yeah, you neural network people, you forget the brain, we're never going to figure out how it works. Neural networks are totally ad hoc. They did more mathematically grounded you know, methods, and, and which were also a little bit ad hoc, actually. Uh, but, uh, so, but this is basically showing you the performance they were getting with these algorithms uh, on this ImageNet 1000 has 1000 category recognition. This is the error rate. And as you can see, the error rate was decreasing, and they were really happy. The, the computer vision field was thrilled with this progress they, they, they've been making. And in 2012, this paper of Alice Krzyzewski came along with this neural network. It was inspired by, by basically the brain's architecture, and that put a dot there. Okay? And that's what kind of got everybody's heads turned and saying, oh my gosh, okay, this is, this is something that has to be taken seriously. Because it's outperforming us on all benchmarks. And since then, uh, the, the, the deep nets uh, have been steadily improving in performance. And uh, so this is, this, is, this is really kind of which created a revolution in the field. And you've probably seen a lot of, read a lot of the this in articles in the paper and the New York Times and so forth. And it's now powering, uh, in addition to maybe some, you know, uh, these, uh, these applications of Facebook where they're going to try to find out what's in your images. Uh, they're, but it's potentially very useful. But, so Flickr, for example, has an application where uh, I could take all of the images you've uploaded and now organize those according to content. So you can say, find me all of my sunset images, or find me all of the images I have in the Grand Canyon. Or you know, take a particular image like that and say, find me the other, the other images that are like that. Okay, so it gives you a way of kind of organizing, organizing your, your photos. Okay. So, so, so this is kind of a neat achievement. You know, this is a kind of a, this is a real breakthrough in technology. That kind of the, the trail for this breakthrough really stems back to findings in neuroscience and engineers and computer scientists being inspired by that. And so, I think one really exciting question is now that these systems are working, can they teach us something about the brain? So, this is basically that same wiring diagram I, I showed you in the beginning, uh, where you know, these different boxes correspond to different visual areas. It's a different wiring, different different rendition of that, but it's basically the same idea. Okay, so this is area V1 down here, V2, and then these higher boxes are selected you know, to uh, more abstract parts of, of the scene. So we, we, we know little bits, tip, little, sort of little bits and pieces about what these what these neurons are doing in different visual areas, but but these areas in the in the middle here, these intermediate level areas, are currently a big mystery. Right now in neuroscience, we don't have any good hypotheses to test when we go probing these intermediate areas in the system. And so, you know, one question naturally arises, well, now that these deep networks are working so well, people, you know, computer scientists have gotten these systems to work and actually do something useful, and they're learning some interesting representations here in this intermediate level areas, well, what are they learning? And do those look like, any, do those look like anything that we see um, in, in, in the brain? Can we use it sort of as a to generate hypotheses of what, what to look for in the brain? And uh, it turns out that uh, if you look at what's in the first layer, which is just going by reference side, the, the, this first layer of representation, which would be sort of akin to V1, it turns out, indeed, so we know a lot about this V1, this primary visual area, primary visual cortex area. And it turns out if you look at the filters in this first area, this network, they look very much like the kind of receptive fields that you find in V1. So if you, 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 know, if you show these to a neuroscientist, they would think, well, gosh, you must have been recording from neurons in V1, um, because that's exactly what they see there. 
if you go up a layer, if you go up a layer in the network, so this is from layer two in the network, you find neurons that are selected to more complex features. So each each panel of nine um, of nine images here is showing you examples of, a, of features that a neuron, uh, one neuron in the system, is selected to. Okay, so this is sort of what they look. The blue blue blob surrounded by red, maybe circular objects, um, you know, sort of curved curved things there, and so forth. So, so that's some, some more sort of some, some, kind of some kind of abstraction of shape in the scene. These are neurons in layer three, which are getting a little bit more complicated. In layer four, and finally in layer five, you find objects that are selected to entire shapes. So here's uh, a neuron that's selected to uh, looks like pieces of wheat. No, I guess face. That's a face there. Yeah. These are faces. These are faces, and then uh, pieces of animal, animal ears, uh, like dog snouts, there, um, and so forth. Okay, so. Um, Okay, good. I think I'm running out of time. So, uh, uh, okay, well, just one final thing about this, maybe to mention, is that is that there's some very interesting things that. Uh, so, so now, if we go and asking, like, is this is are, are these networks really a good model of what the brain is doing? One way to uh, to to test this is to say, well, does does the do, do these networks get confused by the same things that confuse us? Okay, so in perception, we have this notion of a metaver. A metaver are is two things that are physically different. Which look the same. Okay, so for example, if you take um, if you take red light and green light and mix that together, that will look to you like yellow. Okay, so it looked the same to you as though I showed you a, a light at a single wavelength of yellow. Okay, you can't tell the difference between red and green added together versus yellow all alone. That's what we call a metamer in psychophysics. And so it turns out these are metamers of one of these deep networks. So these these images were basically. Um, Created by an evolutionary algorithm is trying to perturb the, uh, the image in pixel space to maximize the response of one of those nodes in the, in the top layer of the network. Okay, so the, in this case, this is an image that the network recognizes as a peacock with 99% accuracy. Okay, so that was a very you know confident. That must be a peacock and nothing else. I'm absolutely certain. Uh, and this is an uh, image that was generated that makes the network think it's a baseball, as a starfish, uh, as a king penguin, and so forth. Uh, so obviously this is a failure mode, right? And this is you know humans can look at these and we can still know that's not a kingpin one, um, and so forth. But in some sense, I mean the network is just kind of to be congratulated for doing this because you know it's it, it sort of created this image. It's obviously picking out the features of a baseball or doing something kind of interesting there. Um, it's, it's basically synthesizing interesting kinds of images that have sort of baseball-like features in, in some sense. Okay, so I, I think I'll um, I'll just end there. I don't. I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to um, talk about um, art, but we can talk about that afterwards, at breaks or something like that. Okay.